panel. So make sure your top supporter information is updated with your current email address. To do that, scroll down and you'll see where it says top supporter rewards. Scroll to the link that says complete your top supporter information. The winner is going to be determined as soon as we announce that tipping is done. So make sure that you get your tips in before that. And tips made after the announcement will not be counted. If you'd like to tip, click the green tip button on the bottom left-hand corner of your Stage It screen. All right, first up today is someone who is not only known to us as Captain Michael Quinn on Project Blue Book and Enzo from Vampire Diaries. He is also an accomplished musician with an incredible, unique voice. Please welcome Michael Malarkey. Yay. Hi. Wow, that applause is just earth-shattering. Love it. How are you all? I hope this uh, finds you well. What a crazy time we're in. The year of 2021. 2020. Moving into 2021 swiftly. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to speak briefly on that, just a tiny bit before I answer some questions. But, um, you know, this year, as much as it's been horrible and confusing and very challenging for most of us, I think has also brought us a lot of uh, wonderful things. And I would challenge all of you to spend um, the end of the year maybe thinking about those things that have uh, changed for you inside for the better, that have made you more woke or realize certain things about yourself or brought you closer to your family. Because those things need to grow this coming year. And we owe it to ourselves to come into 2021 with that kind of energy. Um, and it's not about just like being positive all the time because that's just, just weird, right? There's a lot of that talk going on and it's not, it's it. be real. Focus on being real and uh, let the positive experiences be your guide. Um, but also the negative, right? And I think when we face challenges in our lives, they are opportunities. And if we view them as opportunities for growth, they cease to become horrible things and, and start to become our allies. So that's just something to think about that I thought I would share with you and, and something that I've been thinking about a lot this year because I've been forced into isolation. Um, so I'll answer some questions. Uh, Jessica Ellis asked, how do you... How about you, do you prefer playing a character with different accents to your own? Well, my darlings, as you know, I did play a vampire with a British accent, which was very fun. And all of you probably want to at least hear me do that voice one more time. So uh, there you go. That's it. Hello, gorgeous. I said it later. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I do love the challenge of playing characters with accents different to my own. And I, I very rarely played a character that has my exact way of speaking. Because um, I'm a weird dude. And, uh, you know, it, just as a little, a little backstory for those of you that don't know me, I, I started off living, in, well, I was born in Beirut, Lebanon. Flew up to England and I lived there for a little bit while my dad went job hunting. My dad, who was American, went job hunting in uh, the States and found a job in Ohio. So I moved to Ohio when I was just a toddler um, and grew up there. Moved to London for drama school when I was in my early 20s. Um, my mother has British citizenship, so I had a dual, I have a dual citizenship, British and American. And it was very enticing for me to, to go to London for training because I was pretty obsessed with a lot of, well, anything that wasn't in Ohio <laughs> at the time. I was kind of stagnating there. And um, I just wanted that opportunity to turn over a new leaf and, and start again. And this was getting into Lambda, which was one of the schools that I really wanted to go to for, for drama, was uh, just, it just it happened. I got it, and it was a, a one-way ticket out of there. And uh, so my accent started to shift and change after living there for a number of years. I, I was there for eight or nine years, I think. Went to drama school. You do mostly British plays. You know, I did Irish accent there and some other play and uh, various other ones. But only once.
once did I ever do an American accent. So you kind of naturally assimilate. I think some people are more predisposed to assimilation than others, but if, if your work is focusing on phonetics and accent and dialogue, I think it naturally you start to assimilate um, quicker. But that was my one, one of my biggest uh, issues with drama school is they never tell you, hang on to your accent. So my accent sort of drifted away for a while. And I had this very strange transatlantic hybrid accent going on. And I remember going back to Ohio and my buddy's going like, what the fuck is going on with your accent, dude? Drop it. And me being like, what? I'm not doing, this is just, it's how I talk. What? And um, they were calling me Madonna and everything. And uh, then it took me coming back to the States to do the role of Enzo, ironically, which brought me back my American accent. Now, if you don't understand that, I'll explain it a little better. So I got hired to play Enzo. I did um, one accent in English, British, and one in American for the, for the audition. And um, up until the week I was going to leave, I still didn't know if they wanted him to be English or American. And they finally told me English, and I was, I was relieved, actually, because I felt like it was easier for me, in a way, to do a British accent than it was an American at the time. But I also was very keen to do uh, a character in a British accent because I had never really done one professionally. It was, it was my first, well, second time I'd, I'd done a, a role with a British accent professionally. But it is the, the first time I did one that had a lot more to do. And um, I loved it. It was, it was a challenge, keeping it fresh and keeping it specific. And uh, now uh, being there in Atlanta, working with American actors, uh, speaking to American people all the time, mostly American people, made it easier for me to segue back into reclaiming what my accent used to be like a little more. It was almost like I had to find it again. And now it's somewhere more in the American realm with certain Britishisms if I'm incensed or drunk or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah. Elise, WF, hey, how are you? Michael, in one chat you said you were also up for True Blood. The show is rebooting. Would you consider doing it? Sure, call me. I wish it worked like that. You just be like, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this role." I know that's not what you mean, but yeah, it would hell yeah. I mean, I consider doing anything right now. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of tapes and sending a lot of good stuff out, but it's just a crazy market right now, and um, things are stopping and starting. Other people are some networks are very tentative, and some are just plowing ahead and it's just a weird a weird market so I'm just keeping the faith and just keep doing my thing you know I mean what I do in my life is I just look ahead I focus on the work in front of me you know whether that's what I'm doing at home with my family or whether it's a tape or whether it's music or whether it's just having a conversation with somebody I try to just stay in the moment with what I'm doing and it's it's a really good defense mechanism against dwelling on things or spiraling and it becomes your baseline the more you do it. I mean, people think it's hard to be in the moment all the time and you can't all the time. All you can do is ask yourself to try. And so I'm constantly just asking myself to try to, to be in the moment and not let things fester. And you should too. Alessia, Alicia, Alessia probably. Um, hi, I'm from Russia. Where would you go for a vacation after the coronavirus? Everywhere! Um, man, if I could choose anywhere, let me think. Oh, it's tough. I mean, like, with the kids or without the kids? They're two different things. Yeah. So, with the kids, probably some resort anywhere that had a kids club so my wife and I could just 
lie next to the beach and read books, and drink cocktails. Anywhere. I mean, it could be in my backyard. Put some sand out there and, you know, put a picture of the ocean. I'll be happy if there's a kid's club. Um, I'm joking, but it, it also, as, as you know, all of you other parents out there, how challenging this year has been because we are all at home. We are teaching and we're teaching them at home. And, and, and this has also been a, an amazing thing because I never would be spending this much time with my kids. And it took a while to wrestle that concept into submission, uh, as I'm sure I did for all of you. But now it's almost like, you know, this is what I should be doing. You know, I, I should be this present for my kids and teaching them things and being there for them and creating with them. And so I, I, I'm, I, I feel blessed to have been forced to have this time. I was talking to my meet and greet a little bit about that. Um, there are blessings here. And like I said at the beginning, it's good to focus on those things that have changed us this year. It's the only thing constant, right? We're always changing. We have to embrace the change, embrace the strange, as David Bowie said. Rest in peace. Christy, Louise, any cool behind the scenes stories from Project Blue Book? So many. Um, you think of a good one. Um, well, I can't say that one. Um, okay, wait, hang on. Well, I'll just tell you that Aiden and I got along famously. Um, he's literally like a brother to me. We are still in touch a lot. And I mean, I, he's pretty much the only person I hung out with for the past year outside of my wife. I mean, I spent more time with him than I did my wife probably last year. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just blessed that we got to work together and we got to meet each other and uh, it's, it's, it was a blessing to me. Um, and here's kind of why is because when you have two lead characters like that, you're going to be, whether you like it or not, affected by and affecting the other person and infecting currently if you're on set together. So whatever the vibe is, and I don't know if this is just me and my personality type, whatever that is, but I'm very, very susceptible to other people's energies and emotions and all that. Um, and um, I completely got in from the beginning. You know, I remember meeting him at the hotel for our first rehearsal with Robert Stromberg on episode one. And I'd met Stromberg already on set, but I hadn't met Aiden yet. And he, he comes into the room and um, he's got this kind of awkward energy at first and he's kind of pacing around while we're talking and I just kind of felt like I, I got him completely and not like knew who he was, but like I, I felt like we could gel and um, we just had this way of working that was very push and pull, give and take, um, but also just plowing ahead on our um, mutual and individual tra trajectories. And we just literally were holding each other's arm and just plowing ahead into the woods. And it was um, brilliant. It just completely synergized. And I mean, the behind the scenes stories are just, it's just the whole thing of having a fucking laugh, having the crack, being on each other's side, by crack, that's an Irish expression. I'm going to talk about crack cocaine. Don't do drugs. Um, but uh, the crack in Ireland means if you've got the crack, you've got the, the banter or whatever. You've, you've got your good value. And um, 
we were just always in these shitty conditions working in Vancouver, especially the first season where we were shooting through the winter in the rain, often in the woods and just, you know, like having, having mud everywhere, freezing, and, but still maintaining the ability to have a laugh about it. And I think it's almost the Irish way, you know, me being part Irish too, just fucking grinning and bearing it, get on, get on with it, no matter the cost. Um, but we bitch to each other every once in a while. And if there was something that we were both, both had our knickers in a twist about, we would uh, talk about it, make a decision and approach somebody and, and communicate our, our issue. And so it was an extremely uh, healthy, creative environment uh, with, with us at the helm you know, from the acting side of things. So, uh, yeah, God bless us. Um, Amy Evenden, Evenden, one, two, three. If you could sing with any singer, who would it be? I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't have one. I just, I just do my own thing, you know. HX Snoopy, 2008. Hey, Michael, this is Crystal. We just talked to the meet and greet. Hi, Crystal. Crystal from Vegas, I think. Do people ever tell you you give off Johnny Depp vibes as Enzo? Uh, I don't think so. Sometimes they get that with me, like, in my actual life, because I tend to dress a little alternative to the norm, which, which he does, and uh, sometimes I've gotten that before. Justice for Johnny. Um, Ariana Miller, were you okay with Enzo dying the way he did? <laughs> no. Um, why'd you have to bring it up? Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it is what it is. People, uh, think we have more opinions. Well, maybe some actors do, but for me, it's my job, right? I'm not Enzo. Uh, I pretended to be him for work and that was my job and part of the job is to take the scripts that are given to you deliver them and make it work and then i uh, the only time i ever complained about something uh, to julie pleck was just can i have more stuff to do you know i i just wanted some grittier material and um she also was very responsive to me approaching her in a very direct and sincere and non-positional way. And um, I did my part to work on myself and focus on the craft. And she gave Enzo more to do and uh, linked up with, linked, linked him up with Bonnie as well, which was, was, was a big uh, shift in Enzo's arc and trajectory. And I think it was just a stroke of genius really to, to uh, put those two together, two people that have been completely wounded over the years and um, found each other and supported each other through thick and thin from then on out, you know. Um, it's a great storyline, I think. And so the, the thing about the dying, right? So Julie, she, we, we had a, a drink one night. She said she wanted to have a drink and, and talk to me about the scene, the scene coming up and she let me know. And she was like, I just, I want to tell you out of respect for you, but also you are going to be working through this, the rest of the season. You'll be there as, um, uh, in, in Bonnie's mind or whatever it is. And, uh, so you'll be with us through, through to the end, but I just wanted to let you know. So you're not surprised when you read the script, which was very kind. And, um, I think the right thing to do for actors you know, when big, massive things like that are happening, it is good to, to let them know. Um, and Julie, she's wonderful. I'm, I mean, I've always had an incredible rapport with her and working relationship. And um, I always make time to, for her when we're in the same city. And she does for me. And um, I believe it's important to, to, uh, to do that for, for people who have... Um, made such a, a an impact and been good friends to you in, in the past um, you got to be there for people 
But yeah, at the end of the day, it's just a job. You know, I get in there, I do my thing, and I leave. I get hired as an artist to come in and interpret the script, interpret the character in the way that I think is right. And uh, then you collaborate a bit. And when it's done, it's done. Anne Trudell, what's your favorite part of doing the Vampire Diaries conventions? Well, I mean, a big part of it up until now has been, been seeing my old buddies. You know, it was an opportunity for us to get in the same city again and reconnect, share war stories and horror stories and love stories. <laughs> But now it's very bizarre, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here talking to a, a screen with no noise happening except the noise of my breathing and fidgeting. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a different thing. I mean, what I like about it is that I, I know that people here are connected. And to me, connection is everything. And it's everything that's going to bring us forward into the next year. So stay connected. And anything that does provide connection, um, except if it's based in negativity, is is good so i'm it brings me joy to see this many people interested and connected and excited about a show that happened many years ago so thank you and keep supporting each other and be kind to each other i see a lot of stone throwing and hatred online and infighting and a lot of it is due to different opinions and semantics and it's it's all so much hot air and noise and uh, we just have to remember that people are people, humans are humans, and we, some people mess up sometimes, some people say the wrong thing, and we just have to be, we have to stop bringing people down and wanting to drag people through the mud, you know, it's just not right. So if that's something that you do, maybe just like check yourself a little bit about that, like what are you providing with, with that kind of energy? And if it's something you don't do, then kudos, because we don't need that. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Sarah Mora, what's your favorite line of dialogue? Well, that's tough. It's tough to, to remember anything. Man, these questions are coming so fast. I'm so sorry I can't answer all of you guys. It's nice to see so many people here. And it's a very global representation, which is also cool. Hi, hi everybody. Hi. <laughs> uh, okay, so favorite line of dialogue, let me think. Hmm. Well, there's, there's different ones. I mean, I, I, I loved, for, for Blue Book, I love the line, and it's about timing for this one, and, and, and uh, it's when Aiden is, we're in Roswell, and Aiden's um, recounting this entire story of what he thinks going on with the conspiracy. We're sitting at a diner. And he's done doing this long-winded story and telling me about these events and stuff. And I just kind of stare at him and I go, I'm going to get a cheeseburger. You want a cheeseburger? He goes, do you even listen to everything I said? Um, and I just love the, you know, there's a lot of little gems in there with, with character stuff in season two, especially. If you haven't seen season two of Project Blue Book, it's pure fire. And... Um, it's a complete travesty that they pulled the plug on it because it was nothing to do with how the show was doing because we were literally the number one new scripted cable drama on cable. Yeah. And um, it's, it was, it, as far as I know, and as far as I'm aware, it was a purely financial decision on the part of the network. So we got an unfortunate COVID ax. And I hope that clarifies any reasoning for it. And, um, you know, there's always hoping, but I'm just moving forward and uh, working on what's in front of me. So my favorite line of dialogue from Vampire Diaries, I mean, I do love 
Enzo's last words to Bonnie or whatever, which are, you know, I can't remember the exact words, but I always thought they were a really nice sentiment. Live, live your life, all of it. And something we can all learn from. And I was talking about this recently online. Subsequently, I got attacked, but that's happens online. But um, what I was trying to say is that there are, there's a great lesson to be learned from the Enzo Bonnie tragedy. And I believe in, you know, theater. I believe in lessons learned from drama. And I feel like if everyone has a happy ending, which everyone's gutted when their characters don't, um, if everyone has a happy ending, you're not, what are you learning? What are you learning? Very few people have a, a happy ending because it doesn't end. It just goes on and on and on. Um, and uh, I think the lesson we learned is, is something to do with those lines. You know, it's like people die and yet they still live within us. And they're still able to motivate us if we know how to ask them, if we know how, how to tap into that. And I really liked how Enzo's death played a part in that um, concept. And also to encourage, encourage her to, to, to live her life, all of it, and hopefully to encourage all of you to live your life, all of it. And, um, we spend a lot of time saying no to things and saying that's not me or no. But when we have these preconceived ideas of who we are and half of them are a load of shite. We are capable of so much more than we give ourselves credit for. We only use about 10% of our brain. And I feel like as a species, we're still only waking up. This is not the death of civilization as we know it. I think it's maybe the beginning. We've spent so long using primal fuels to power our, ourselves, and we, and yet at our fingertips, we have the ability to power ourselves with just the sun. So I think we're coming out of this strange dark age that, that uh, is all married with technology, but I don't know. I'm interested to see where it all goes from here. Keep the faith. Live your life, all of it. Bera Michelson, uh, or I am Bera Kipichoglu. Wow, I can't pronounce that, I'm sorry. I'm from Turkey. My question is, do you prefer acting or singing? Um, now, I always say I love both for different reasons, which is true. I personally find music to be the more directly fulfilling thing for me as an artist. Um, acting is very much a wrestling match and a love hate thing. You know, I'm, I give myself such a, not a hard time, but it's, there's such an intensity to acting that can be stressful and saps a lot of your energy. You have to be full on a lot of the time. Whereas energy for me is like, I'm sitting back with coffee, DJ, writing some music, I'm on stage, I'm hanging out with my buddies, I'm doing my thing. It's a very comfortable, open channel relationship with art. And it's very much who I am as a person. You know, I grew up with music. I started playing music before I even started working as an actor and been making records since I was young. So for me, it's just part of my personality, part of my, my being. And acting is my job. And I happen to really love my job, but I also hate it because of everything else that comes along with it. The uh, BS in between working is horrible. I love working. I love being on set, but like all this stuff in between and all the crap with PR and interviews and, you know, all that stuff is just exhausting. And I don't like being on display. Um, you know, I don't like the whole pageantry of it. 
I just wish it was more of a, uh, treated as more of an art and less of a celebrity culture type thing. I long for the, the time when we could go around on a river, you know, on a raft on a river as a theater troupe and just set up and do a play for the, the town and then just move on. Um, I'd love to do something like that. That's low key and rewarding. Uh, and maybe I will. Uh, anyone got a raft? But you know, things change. Uh, you know, my my feelings on these matters are always shifting, and I think we have to be open to to changes. And we aren't fixed as an entity, right? You'll find that the more fixed something tends to be, the more dead it tends to be. Um, you know, a stone doesn't move much, but do you want to be like a stone, or do you want to be like a human? that has the ability to shift and change. I think people oftentimes are accusatory when people have changed. You've changed. And uh, your answer should always be, yeah, yeah, I've fucking changed. You haven't changed. <laughs> Which one's more of an insult? Food for thought. Hey, Michael, I'm Kelly. What would be your ideal next role? Or would you like to create your own project? Well, I tell you what, I've got a really good team. I love my team, my agents and my manager and everything I'm going up for at the moment is something where I'm like, hell yeah, I'd love to do that. Except like one out of, out of one out of six maybe, but, uh, which is a good ratio as far as that goes. So they, we know each other well, we've been together for years and, and they know the kind of, Thing I'm at. The thing is, it doesn't matter what I do. It's about how I feel about what I'm doing. And sometimes I don't know what I want to do, but I know it when it's there. And I don't know if that has something to do with just my brain or, or what, but I find it overwhelming sometimes to think about what to do um, next, you know, because I don't know. I mean, usually when I think like that, it's like I just want to do something completely different to the last thing. Or I want to challenge myself. It's more of a intention of how I want to feel about the next thing I'm doing as opposed to what kind of project I want to do. And that being said, I would love to create my own projects, but it's one of those things where I need to get a team and all that. Like, I don't know where to begin as far as that stuff goes. For music, I can. Like, I'm creating some music projects right now. Um, collaborating with some people and um, taking it slow, but that, that's, I, I know how to navigate that kind of thing. So I just focus on that. And um, in the meantime, I'll just try to get an acting job so I can go record another badass record for y'all. <laughs> Very hard to write at the moment with the kids at home. Uh, let's see, say hello to some other people here. Hey, Michael, it's Alice. What are the predictions for the third season of Project Blue Book? I'm really looking forward to the continuation. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know what the future looks like. Um, not promising, probably, if we're being honest. It just, uh, it's a crazy, crazy market right now. So for now, Malarkey and Momoa are under the sea, drinking absinthe, hanging out with squids and stuff. Tanya, 17. Hello, Michael. My name is Tanya. Which character is closer to you, Enzo or Michael Quinn? Michael Quinn. Yeah, definitely. Um... I, I, also, I play in closer to where I am now in my life, I suppose. So you do bring a lot of yourself to the role. Um, I mean, he's, I'm probably somewhere right in the middle of those two guys, but with a dash of Willy Wonka or something. <laughs> um, I'm definitely a lot, you know, more off kilter than, than both of those guys. And uh, scatterbrained. 
But God bless the scripts. And they tell you what to say. You don't have to come up with words. Um, but yeah, it was it was really a joy playing Captain Michael Quinn. It was a it was a real blessing, and I did bring a lot of myself to that role. But he he brought a lot to me. He made me a lot more focused as a person. He uh, made me a lot more honest, and um, he also. made me fight more for what I believe to be the right things. And those are the gifts that were, were given to me by him, which are arguably some of the things I brought to the role. So you kind of don't know where you end and the character begins. But all I know is around that time, those things that I just mentioned were very much growing in me and present in my life. It's bizarre. It really is bizarre, the whole acting process, because it's, it's, it's such a ever-moving beast, you and the character. And you can't help but be affected by it, by the roles you play. Because you're literally, you're, you're, you're the psychologist for this character. You know, they're lying on your couch and you're asking them questions and you're finding out deeper truths about them and empathizing with them. And you care. You're not getting a paycheck for it. You're doing it there out of charity, you know. And um, one of the biggest blessings I feel about being an actor is, is that sense of empathy that you really get for most people in the world. And um, I'll always entertain other people's opinions on things, even if they are contrary to my own, because I have a, an intense curiosity about what makes people think certain things. I mean, even people who are super into conspiracies and all that, you know, it's easy to write off people as being cuckoo or whatever, but like everybody has a truth. And um, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And we're in this in the middle of this culture where people want to homogenize themselves and cut off other people and things. And it's a tough one because, you know, when it involves things like racism and homophobia and transphobia and all that, you can't, I mean, fuck that, fuck those people, you know, but I'm, I'm not talking about that per se, just so you know. Um, but we, we, we owe it to, our other fellow humans to at least believe that they're doing what they think is right for them. And as long as it's not harming anybody else or based in hatred, um, it's usually worth empathizing with. That's my two pence on the matter. And that's, that's, uh, you see, it's not like you have to be friends with these people, but I think it's this, this energy of, Slandering people, dragging people down is, um, I don't know, it's dangerous. It's even dangerous for me to talk about it because people will immediately clump me into a certain category, you know? So uh, it's bizarre. It's a bizarre time to be a half alive. <laughs> um, Tanya17, we answered your question there. Um, Yesenia Michelson, do you speak more than one language? Uh, no. I mean, I speak a tiny bit of French because I lived in Cameroon when I was 15, 16 years old. And I was forced to go to a French school where they taught in French. Do I have something on my camera there? Hang on. See it then. Um, maybe it's a... I'm bugged. They've bugged me. You know where I am. I speak a bit of French, yeah. I, I, so I was forced to go to a, uh, a French school down there. Um, and it was really hard because I'd had only about a year and a half of very slacker high school French. And so, you know, I was like, oh yeah, I can speak a little bit of French. And I go down there and everyone's talking so fast, you know. And also the... 
um, the uh, uh, the African uh, French, you know, is a bit different than the French that I'd been taught by like a Spanish woman in Ohio. <laughs> so you're kind of dealing with dialect as well as language that's moving faster than you're able to keep up with. So it was very difficult, but you know what? I think a lot of that uh, really helped me to learn to read people uh, in a deeper way than I would if I was just using language. I think we, we rely a lot on language and forget to read body language and facial expressions because all the secrets to a person's inner workings are, are in that, you know? The words are just the, like the shit on top, right? They're, they're words they're using as, as tactics or things to point you know, that's all words are. They're little guidelines. What's underneath? What's the story? How do they feel about what they're saying? <clears throat> and all that stuff is gold for an actor, really, you know? And um, I suppose it was really my first forced introduction into the world of subtext. Because it's pretty much all I dealt with there was subtext. I was communicating subtextually and with my mind. But what was cool about that, you know, I started off, I was painfully shy. And everyone's always baffled when, when they hear this because I seem to be very good with talking and communicating. But no, it was not always the case. I was painfully shy to the point where it was almost crippling. Um, to the point where I almost became a selective mute. I could not deal with the anxiety I would get socially through school up until when I went to Africa. And it was a pivotal, a pivotal moment to me because it was the first time I really, well, I, I didn't have to talk, right? So it was an excuse. It was a get out of jail free card. So I was able to hang out with people and not, feel the anxiety of having to communicate. And I'm sure some of you guys can relate to this. Like social anxiety was one of my biggest hurdles in life. And something that comes back when I'm feeling, you know, uh, guarded or whatever, you know, I just can't deal with certain like party situations. I don't have to deal with it now, which is great. But sometimes it's like too much and I go back into that mode. But um, going to Africa and it really made me open up and I was embraced there as, you know, I was like somewhat of a foreigner I'm from America. They, everybody wants to know about uh, America and Coca-Cola and, you know, Metallica and everything. And um, <clears throat> I made friends with a bunch of skaters. I was in skateboarding at the time. And um, we used to go drive around listening to music go skating. Um, I dated a girl there briefly as well. And we all shared music and hung out on the rooftops of Douala. And uh, it was a killer time. One of the records I listened to the most there was Nirvana Bleach. I remember blasting that in the car with six of us piling out of it, you know, going to the skate park. And uh, really, really great memories. And it was so long ago, it's hard to, hard to remember it all. Another record that changed my life, which came the year before that I was still listening to a lot, was Rancid and Out Come the Wolves. Um, those two records, and Green Day Kerplunk as well. That, those, those three were, were played quite a lot while, while we were down there. Fun times. Uh, last question I got here for you. Thank you guys all for being here and listening to me rabbit onwards. Um, so, hi Michael, I'm Regina. What do you think Enzo would do in this pandemic? Oh, he would be delighted. He knows everyone's home. He knows where to find people. Plus, uh, you know, it's, I don't think the COVID would affect vampires really. So, easy pickings. <laughs> it's a dark thought to end on. 
Well, anyway, thank you guys so much for being here and uh, your interest and support in the show and what I do as well. I, I hope this finds you well, like I said. And please, please go forth in 2021 with fire in your gut. Bring people together. Don't pull them apart. And let's, uh, let's do this. We got it. Got it. Big love.